Direct and direct proof and proof by contradiction positive are two methods we've introduced so far in our lecture series for proving conditional statements like P implies Q. Okay, um, we've also introduced uh, a method of proof known as proof by contradiction, uh, for which you you assume the negation of your conclusion and then you derive a contradiction that there's some statements true but also is false thus making the negation you assumed actually the opposite. It was actually the other way around. Uh, and so I wanted to mention specifically, how does one use proof by contradiction specifically when you're trying to prove a conditional statement? Because it turns out you can squish this method of contradiction into the direct proof method. Because if you're trying to do a direct proof, you would, if you're trying to prove again this statement right here, you would assume in your proof here, whoops, you would assume that P is true. And then you would make some arguments and then you would conclude that Q is true. That proves then the conditional statement. But what if you're struggling to prove that Q is true? What you could then do is you could assume P is true and then you could also assume by way of contradiction, you could assume that not Q is true. Then you're like, okay, so now you have two assumptions instead of just one. You can then be like, ah, da, 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 da. there's a statement R we proved to be true. Some more arguments, you get not R, and that gives us, of course, a contradiction. And therefore, that means that Q is actually true, thus proving the conditional statement as well. So one can prove a conditional statement by assuming the hypothesis and assuming the negation of the conclusion. You derive a contradiction. That means the conclusion was actually true, which means the conditional statement P implies Q is true as well. So let me show you this variation of uh, proof by contradiction on on the case of a conditional statement. So for example, let's take this statement. If A and B are, are both integers such that A is greater than or equal to two, then it must be the case that A does not divide B or A does not divide B plus one. Okay, that is to say that an integer greater than two can't divide consecutive integers. It can't divide both of them. So this is an if then statement, right? If then, so if A and B are integers such that a is greater than or equal to two, then we have some conditions about divisibility. So if I want to prove this by direct proof, then what I would do is I would assume the hypothesis there. Oh, let A and B be integers such that A is greater than or equal to two. Now, when you look at the statement here, I'm actually trying to prove a negation, right? I'm trying to prove that A doesn't divide B or A doesn't divide B plus one. Um, you have some negations here. You have an or statement. It actually might be best to look at the negation of this statement. So proof by contradiction might be very helpful. So it's useful to declare this in your proof. Suppose for the sake of contradiction that A divides B and a divides B plus one. So notice I took this statement right here, applying the De Morgan laws. If you negate an or statement, it becomes an and statement. And then of course, if you negate a statement like A doesn't divide B, that would become A doesn't not divide B, that is A divides B, like so, and then A divides B plus one. So okay, I'm thinking that because of the, how this is phrased, right, I'm trying to prove that an integer can't divide two consecutive integers, at least not if you're bigger than uh, two or equal to two. Uh, but it feels a little awkward because of the negations of the or, and so I think the negation would be easier to work with here. So we're going to assume for the sake of contradiction that A does divide B and A divides B plus 1. Okay, um, well, how's that going to go then? Well, if A divides B, that means there's some integer N such that B is equal to A N. And likewise, because A divides B plus 1, that means there's some integer M such that B plus 1 is equal to A M. And so we have then these factorizations of B and B plus one. Let's play around with those for a moment. For example, if I take these two equations and subtract them from one another, um, I'll get the following, B plus one minus B on the left-hand side, and then you're gonna get AM minus AN on the right-hand side. Now B plus one minus B is gonna give you two, uh, excuse me, where did two come from? It's gonna give you one, B plus one minus B is one. Um, then you're gonna get AM minus AN. You can factor out the common divisor of A right there, and this is gonna equal A times um, n minus n. Now, if you look at that equation there, this tells us that a divides one. Uh, but now this is where the problem is gonna come into play. The only divisors of one are plus or minus one. And by assumption, um, by assumption, we have that a is greater than or equal to two. If 
a divides one, that means a equals plus or minus one, which means a is less than two. We get a contradiction. Um, a cannot be less than two while also being greater than equal to two. So we get this contradiction. Once you uh, once you arrive upon your contradiction, you can actually end the proof right there. I mean, we said that earlier. For the sake of contradiction, we're going to assume the opposite of what we want. Once you get a contradiction, that means you've now proven it. You can stop at that moment. A contradiction has been found. End of the proof. If you want to put some words in there to say things like, well, because we have a contradiction, this means the other statement holds, you can do that if you want to. But as the statement of the proof is still on the, you know, it's listed there on the page, once you have that contradiction and you've told the reader you're proving my contradiction, there is no actual need to go any further. There's no clarity that's necessary. It should be clear to the reader. Oh, you're, you're proving something by contradiction. You found the contradiction. Therefore, the proof then follows. This is a valid proof argument. You can stop at that moment there. Let's see another example of this, where again, we're gonna prove the conditional using contradiction here. Uh, this time, let the statement be, suppose that A is an integer. If A is even, uh, excuse me, if A squared is even, then A is even as well, okay? So conditional statement, if, then. So we're gonna assume that A squared is even, but for the sake of contradiction, we're going to suppose that A is not even. That is, A is odd. And so that's how we start our proof here. For the sake of contradiction, it's generally a good idea when you do a proof by contradiction to tell the reader that. Because if you don't preface that you're doing a proof by contradiction, they might be like, why are you getting the negation of the thing you're trying to prove? Oh, proof by contradiction. For the sake of clarity, just tell the audience that you're going to prove by contradiction here. So for the sake of contradiction, suppose that A squared is even, but... A is not even. A squared is even, but A is not even, which of course, if A is not even, then it's odd. Well, what does it mean to be even? If A squared is even, that means there exists some integer n such that A squared equals 2n. If A is odd, what does that mean? It means there's an integer m such that A equals 2n plus 1. We have to derive a contradiction somehow. How are we going to do that? Well, we could take this statement for A and plug it in for A squared and see what happens. So if you take A squared and replace the A with a 2n plus 1, you now have 2m plus 1 squared. You could FOIL that out. You'd end up with 4m squared plus 4m plus 1. Um, combining terms there, like because after all, 4m squared and 4m are both even numbers. You could factor out a 2. You end up with 2 times 2m squared plus 2m plus 1. Um, this right here is an integer. Times it by 2, of course, is an even integer. Plus 1 makes it an odd integer. This is an odd integer. So wait a second. a squared is an even number and it's an odd number. That's not a possibility. Um, this gives us the contradiction we were looking for. Now, I do want to make mention here, particularly with this last proof, while this proof does, in fact, prove the statement, we now know this is a true statement, this is a valid proof, one could make the argument that the proof that we just provided using contradiction is perhaps a little bit more awkward than how we could have done it, like, say, proof by contrapositive. It actually would be maybe more straightforward. And in fact, I'll talk more about this in the next video for the next and last video for lecture 23. How do you decide between direct proof, proof by contradiction, or proof by contrapositive? There are strengths and weaknesses to all of those methods. Um, and so, like I said, I'll say some more about that in the next video. What I want to mention right now as we finish this video is that with these different methods we've introduced, so like I said, we have direct proof. Uh, we have contrapositive. We have proof by contradiction, which I'll write that one here as well. These are all techniques that we can use to prove conditional statements like P implies Q. But these three techniques are just one of many methods you can use to prove a contra uh, to prove a conditional. But there's other things we, we're able to prove, like we can prove things about integers using induction, strong induction, the well-ordering principle, uh, proof by smallest counterexample uh, also should be included in that. Uh, we've proven things from combinatorics using combinatorial proof. We can prove and statements, conjunctions. We can prove or statements, disjunctions. There's a lots and lots and lots of proofs out there. Um, we do proofs by cases. Sometimes you have to break it up into cases. Um, my point is that as our proofs get longer and more complex, it becomes more important and actually commonplace to, uh, to start combining all of these different proof techniques. The three I have listed on the screen, some of the other ones I listed but didn't write down, and then so many other proof techniques that we haven't even discussed so far. You might have to start combining lots of different proof techniques um, into a single proof. Uh, like we said beforehand, if you're trying to prove a conditional statement, you might begin with direct proof. So you start off with like, okay, in our proof, we're going to assume 
whoops, assume that P is a thing. Now we then want to prove that Q is true as well. But if Q is itself like a compounded statement, like instead of Q, if you have something like, if itself is a conditional statement, Q implies R, well, then you're like, well, then, okay, to prove that, I'm then going to assume, again, just using by direct proof, we're going to assume Q in that manner. But what if R is itself like, oh, it's uh, it's R or S, well, then and how do you how do you prove an or statement? You're going to assume like, well, okay, assume not R. And then this is just, and then you have to keep on going. Eventually, you want to conclude uh, S is a thing. Uh, there's a lot of things you could do there. And so when you start writing, you start writing proofs inside of proofs inside of proofs. And this can get really complicated and long. And so sometimes when one writes a proof, you have to break it up because it just starts getting too big. This is the notion of a lemma. One might introduce a lemma because the proofs start to get long that you're going to sort of encapsulate a small part of the proof in this one lemma. And then the next lemma has the next part of the proof. And then after you have a bunch of lemmas combined, then you prove a theorem where you're going to start citing lemmas and propositions you've proven previously. This is what you have to sometimes do. Now, fortunately for, for the students of this course, our proofs are probably not going to get that long that you have to start breaking up into smaller lemmas and lemmas and lemmas. But nonetheless, this idea of writing a proof inside of a proof is a necessary thing to do. And so I do want to illustrate this as we uh, finish this video on combining techniques here. Consider the proposition that every non-zero rational number can be expressed as a product of two irrational numbers. How are we going to do that? Well, uh, it is essentially just a if-then statement. If, if you have a non-zero rational number, then it can be factored as a product of two irrationals. So we start with our non-zero irrational and then argue that it has such a factorization. So that's how we begin. Suppose R is a rational number, which is non-zero. R belongs to the set Q, which makes it rational, and then we specifically say it's non-zero. Well, because it's a rational number, that means there exist integers A and B, such that R equals A over B. And B, of course, we can assume is also a non-zero number. So that's what it means to be a non-zero rational number. We could also assume that A is non-zero. I guess I should throw that in there as well. Um, a is non-zero because it's a not so because it's a rational number b can't be zero the denominator can't but because it's non-zero we also have that a is not zero that'll be necessary later on in the proof now previously in our lecture series specifically in um in theorem 6102 there uh we proved we proved that the square root of two is in fact an irrational number we've argued that this cannot be rational. This is just following Euclid's classic argument there. Um, and be aware if you're confused about the numbers, we're not necessarily going in the order that the book is in. So just, just so you're aware, no big deal there. Uh, it, it's just it's just citing it here. So we've already, we've already previously seen in our lecture series that the square root of two is not a rational number. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite R as, well, we know it's A times B. I'm gonna rewrite it as the square root of two times a over b times the square root of 2. Okay? Now we know that the square root of 2 is an irrational number. If I can show that a divided by b root 2 is likewise irrational, then this would be the factorization we desire. And so this is where we get to that idea of a proof inside of a proof, right? We need to show that this number is likewise irrational. We've already used a proof inside of a proof because we cited a theorem we've already proven. That's that's a more subtle way, but even still, we have to then prove something we haven't proven already. And so this sentence right here serves to just uh, tell the audience what we're going to do. We have a claim. I claim that this number is rational. We are now going to show it. And if we show it, that finishes the proof that we want to do. And now, how are we going to show that A over B root 2 is irrational? Basically the same way that we showed the square root of 2 is irrational, proof by contradiction. So suppose to the contrary that A over B root 2 is a rational number. Now, if it's a rational number, there exist integers C, D, such that A over B root 2 is equal to C over D. Um, which, of course, be aware that the square root of 2 is not, is not 0. Uh, the R itself is not 0. So this product is not 0. Now, this is helpful because when we work with this thing, we, might, we want to make sure we don't divide by 0. Um, since the square root of 2 is not 0, its reciprocal is not 0. Um, and so in particular, at, when you look at this CD here, this is this is R times 1 over the square root of 2. 
r is not zero, one over two is not zero, so this product is also not zero. The reason this is relevant is that CD has a reciprocal, um, and particularly it's D over C. This is that relevance why I said A earlier was non-zero, um, so that when you flip this thing upside down, this is a well-defined rational number. Um, we want to make sure, because CD could be a rational number, but DC might not be, particularly if you take like zero over one. This is a rational number, but one over zero is not. Oh, shoot, I just said zero is not a rational number. That's, that's an official JK there. Um, one over zero is not rational because uh, it's, it's not even a real number. Um, so you have to watch out for that, but we don't have to worry about that because we've taken care of things. R is, is non-zero, so the reciprocal is gonna be non-zero here. So if you take this equation and you work things around, um, you can actually show that the square root of two is equal to R times D over C, okay? Uh, and which remember, R is a rational number, we also have that DC is a rational number because it's the reciprocal of CD, which is a rational number, non-zero. So you get that the square root of two is a product of two rational numbers, uh, which would imply that it's a rational number. But we also know by the theorem we stated earlier that the square root of two is not a rational number. Uh, therefore, we get a contradiction. The contradiction then gives us the opposite of what we assumed. Now, in this case, because, in this case, because the original expression is not what we're negating right now. Uh, we actually should probably mention what it is that we negated. Uh, the, what, what do we do contradiction on? Just to remind the reader, the reader here, we assumed, we're trying to prove that A over B root two is, is irrational. So we assumed it was rational. We got a contradiction. Therefore, that means A over B root two is irrational, which then finishes the proof for the reasons we had mentioned before. So again, as your proofs get longer and more complicated, it becomes more necessary to write proofs inside of proofs. And you can use language to help it make clear to the audience what you're doing here. You can tell them the proof pattern you're using, like we're gonna use proof by contradiction, or we can prove by the contrapositive. If you're doing direct proof, don't say that. I mean, that's sort of like the default. That's why we call it direct proof. Um, you only need to specify to the reader what technique you're using if it's an indirect proof. Um, like contrapositive or contradictions. Um, but then you can also make claims in the middle of the proof like we did before. Um, we have the claim, this claim that we needed, that we need this fact to finish the proof. And then you can remind the reader after you've proven it that that finishes it. Um, giving your reader some hints um, some guideposts, some mile markers on what you're doing in the proof can be very helpful the more complicated your proofs get. Um, again, you can use any of the methods we've learned, transposition, contrapositives, um, that, that first one was not a thing, sorry, contrapositives, contradictions, and direct proof induction. Um, you can start to, all of these proof, different proof techniques come together to form more complicated proofs. Give your audience some help and guide them through the proof together. Much in the same way that I narrate these proofs, we wanna put that into writing to help, the, to help your reader understand these proofs as you start combining techniques together.